Welcome back to another WBNL Coaching Ask Five. Today we're going to interview a longtime person that we've known here that has been part of our WBNL Coaching family who has really taken a great uh, journey, if you will, from agent to team leader to starting his own brokerage, and that's Paul Hollib. So we're looking forward to having a conversation with him. That's right. Join us today on the Wandering But Not Lost podcast. You've reached the WBNL Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. And now your hosts, Jan O'Brien and Matt Emerson. Well, welcome everyone to the WBNL Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. This is episode 253. You can find all of our show notes over at WBNLpodcast.com. Jan O'Brien, back to the S5, season two, second episode. Looking forward to talking to Paul today. Um, I've lo been loving editing our season one mashups together. We have the first three questions that have been out, and they're really great. You know, and we have the we have the twelve guests in this in the first season, and to hear all of their answers side by side has been a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to getting those next two out, and then of course when we get to the end of season two, it'll be fun to do another mashup. Hey, 12, well. 12 new yeah, people, 12. right? Yeah. Ask five of 12 people <laughs> or 10 exactly. people, however many it was. And honestly, uh, it's great. I've learned a lot. I mean, I, I wa watched those again and I took notes. I actually listened to, uh, I, I just recently listened, I took a little trip and I listened to Atomic Habits, which was amazing. And, and I, I heard that book before, but we got it from one of our guests. I'm thinking it was uh, maybe Chance brown who right. talked about it but hello thank you chance if you're listening because you're right that is an amazing book and i highly recommend that everybody read it or listen to it as i did so awesome. let's let's see let's what paul in. has to let's tell bring us in paul. Mm -hmm. hey, Hi, paul. Paul. welcome to the podcast you've been on our podcast before but we're very excited to get an update on your story and why don't we jump into that and just tell our listeners remind them if they haven't been with us a long time who you are and how'd you get to where you are right now Huh. Well, hey, my name is Paul Holub. I'm a broker here for Traditions Realty. I uh, live and work in Houston, Texas, and I've been an agent since 2013. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I've been coaching with Jan. She's um, pretty early on, you know, when I wanted to move from agent to, you know, team leader and to grow. And so she really helped me with, you know, setting up those systems and processes and, and to think big and systematically. So, um, yeah, so I'm happy to share some of my experiences. And you recently, in part of our coaching, you kind of did go through a process of deciding whether or not, like, what would be your next journey? I feel like a lot of us go through, and you've been, a, you were a long time at the same brokerage, weren't you? Were you a Keller Williams agent for how long? Correct. Yeah, I started in 2013 at Keller Williams and mm -hmm. uh, have been there the entire time. So it's uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty uncommon for most agents because... True. Move around a lot more than that. And that's <laughs> that loyalty thing, which which was a big decision for you to go, you know, do I stay like that kind of scenario or do you what got you to the idea that you you were to a place where you're like, you know, I want to try this on my own because that's what you did. Right. Just basically last year. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, I just started my brokerage here in uh, in April and made that decision a little while ago. Uh, we talked about that last year. <clears throat> And um, yeah, no, I was at, at KW. They were great. I mean, just learned so much uh, about the business the process. I'm really great. Met some great people. Love my broker. Um, and so just really, you know, had the, the basics at Keller Williams. And then um, in 2017, I got my broker's license. And that was amazing because it really helped me save a lot. You know, I was able to set up the, the LLC and save money on taxes. And that really helped me out in that aspect. But also just to Kind of further me along as far as the goals that I wanted to accomplish and uh, and, and to grow uh, my business, um, and so I, had, I put together a small team. We you know hired assistants, had a buyer's agent, and going through that process and learning you know to work with people and deal with uh, the systems and that that was a, a big learning experience. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, for the past couple of years at, at Keller Williams, I mean, um, I've loved it there. But I was just kind of thinking like uh, you know I really want to. Uh, make a little bit of a change. I'm, I'm ready for maybe the next step. And um, part of the reason was one, just, you know, save money. You know, it was, the market was hot last year. I was thinking, okay, interest rates go up 7%. I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So in my mindset, I was like, I want to be lean. I want to be able to keep my costs down as much as possible. I want to be flexible with the market. If it, you know, it, it, it dies and okay, great. I'll, I'll make it because my, my expenses aren't going to be super high. You know, and Keller Williams is, has that hybrid model. It's like you you pay your commit your your percentage based on what you sell. So there's always that. Um, but I just wanted to save a little bit more. So that was a big 
determining mm -hmm. factor. Um, and then the other thing was that I wanted to go to a different brokerage, but those that were a little bit cheaper, I just, I didn't love the brand and the image and I could see myself maybe trying it out. And then uh, if it didn't work, I'd go change, you know, possibly change again. And I just don't want to have all those expenses and, you know, hassle. I just want to really be able to focus on my clients mm -hmm. And really build a brand that I, I love and trust and, you know, can stand behind. So I think that was another big reason. It's like I want a brand that I can have for a long time, develop, and just really kind of, uh, you know, uh, put behind my name. So that and was how did you come up with that? Because I remember you talking about your names and going whether you were going to go with your name. This is probably a good thing for people to think about if you're thinking about it. Do you go with your name versus how you came up with traditions? which I love that name. So can you talk a little bit about your journey of trying to decide what to call the brokerage? Yeah, I really wanted to be like Hall of Real Estate or Hall of Realty, but that was mm -hmm. all taken. Um, you know, oh, that was a big part of it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, all right. You know, that well, that's easy. actually tip number one. You go check and make sure the name is available, the dot coms available, right? And that you can get it through your local, you know, real estate entity or your association, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, I yeah, listened to um, the the ten steps to starting your own brokerage, and that was after I'd already gone through the process <laughs> that you came out with that uh, the podcast. So I wish it would have been <laughs> even though we went through the steps, it was would have been nice to have that. Um, but yeah, checking that out to make sure that was available was, was the first step, and I just didn't want to have like a super long uh, the hall of the hall of realty and associates. You know, it was just it was too long. It was it was too much of a mouthful, and so. Just kind of searching around uh, traditions came up so oh, let's see what's available around traditions and traditions realty was available surprisingly uh in texas so uh, i was able to to snag that but it was like you said in the the top the 10 steps that you need to do it's it's kind of a challenge it's like, okay great it's available through the state of texas but then i need to check it out with my local association har and then also with uh what's available on the website and um, you know, if there are any um, you know web things available for that, and so that was a challenge. Just trying to okay, I like this name, but okay, there's nothing available, or, and, and so there's just so much going on with that. That was a challenge, but thankfully, I found uh, traditionshouston.com was available, and I was like, okay, that's close enough to Traditions Realty because um, that was that was definitely taken. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was gonna um, say because that's such a good name, but do you feel like when you told me that name, I was like, wow, that really suits you. Do you feel like that? embodies who you are, you know, when it comes to what, what you represent and anybody that joins you is they're going to have to be part of that. Cause that's what it feels like to me. Yeah, I think so too. It just, it's the, the tradition of excellence is kind of what my tagline mm -hmm. is. I want to kind of keep working that and developing it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so having that, that mentality, okay, great. The traditions, realties, uh, traditions, of excellence kind of keeps mm -hmm. me kind of focused there. Um, cool. but yeah, I think it, it fits my personality and uh, and who I am. So, so much you can do that. So that helps out as well. Are you thinking, Matt, like marketing ideas, like uh, how you can create traditions at Traditions Realty, you know? like uh, Yeah, there's so many paths you can go down with that. I, I'll uh -huh. tell you, the, the icon, you know, your the logo is beautiful. I mean, and it actually, you know, it speaks to what you've just been talking about as far as, you know, what your kind of the ethos of the company is. So good job on all that. Thank you. I appreciate it. So my next question is this, and it's like w considering the market. Okay. So I don't want you to answer this based on how the market has been, but do you feel that when you went and made the step was one of your concerns or your people that you get most of your business through referral, right. And, and database, but you also have other lead sources and so forth that you've been using uh, for years. Did you, do you feel that you, your business stayed the same is, the market just the market is the market so you know what i'm asking did you lose any business do you feel like the business remained the same in other words are people follow you they're going to go where you go is that was that your experience or because there's a lot of people that think that the brand is everything and i'm not one of those people who actually thinks that because as a broker i've i've, I've lost people and the people didn't stay with us they went with the agent you know the their clients what was your experience uh, doing that how did you tr tell your people that you had transitioned yeah, a good question. Um, yeah, since I just started in April, um, you know, I put out a video, sent an email, and um, you know, started letting people know that hey, I switched over, and people were excited, like, oh, okay, great. I think only my career, I've only had a couple um, unmet clients that you know, I was talking with, like, oh, you're with Keller Williams, you know, that's a it's a well known brand. It's a little, little familiarity with with that, so. 
Um, but otherwise, you know, it, I think most consumers don't, you know, most clients don't really care you know, as long as like, Hey, I, I trust Paul and then I'm gonna work with him, there you, go. you know? So, uh, so that wasn't a huge hurdle for me, thankfully. And, um, so far I haven't run into that yet. Okay. Very good. I get it. And then, um, question, the, the, the other question that I have, Matt, if you have some questions, but they're just popping into my head. Um, the, what would be your advice for someone? You just mentioned a few things. If someone was really in the shoes, if you were coaching someone on, kind of where somebody like yourself that's been at a company thinking about doing this, what would be the best advice that you give them? Like what advice, if you could go back and do it again, is there anything that you learned or what advice would you give somebody to really, you know, analyze the situation before you jump in and make a decision? Okay. Yeah. I mean, like, like what we talked about in coaching was really what's the end game here? Is it to have a big mm. brokerage? You know, you know, we talked about you know, different franchises and whatnot, and it's just, <clears throat> really just wanted to be like uh, almost like a small team you know, as a small broker is really just kind of myself and my assistant currently. And in the future, I probably will have some other client, other agents underneath me, but um, I just don't want to like grow a big team. And early on in my, in my career, you know, I had this big, you know, organizational chart and how I wanted to grow my business. And it was just, you know, as, as I've gone on, like, I was like oh, man, it's just so many people to manage and whatnot. Like I, that doesn't, doesn't excite me anymore. And I, I don't think that's where my goals are. And I've been listening a lot to, to Seth Godin, and he ha always has a tagline, the smallest viable market. And um, I think that kind of helped reaffirm. I mean, Seth's been super you know, successful and made a lot of money. But uh, yeah, <laughs> now we can do the smallest viable market for different products and books. Um, and that's the same thing. It's like I have a, a very the viable market, my clients that know and trust me, um, that I can serve. And I don't need this massive big team to, to feel successful and to have success for – for my goals, for my family and my life. So I think that's part of it. Like I want to just kind of be small and kind of have more control over it. Um, and then the biggest challenge for me, um, just getting started was just like we talked about is, is the whole naming and LLC. And, and the biggest challenge was I had my, my team name at Keller Williams was the hall of team. And then I had to get that transferred over to traditions, realty LLC. And that was like a big challenge. So I had mm -hmm. to preserve the name. I had that. And then I had to get that transferred over and was working with, I think, like LegalZoom or one of those online uh, companies. And it just was a total hassle. And at the end of the day, I just ended up firing them and just doing it myself, uh, even though I'm not a good, I'm not great at taxes and, and all that. But mm -hmm. um, that was the biggest challenge, just just getting the name and the LLC all set up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a, I have a good accountant but as far as some of those things i just kind of had to you know figure out my own unfortunately figure it out. yeah yeah that's good time business. i mean that process takes you know that suck that's a time suck right so i mean right. you know yeah. and you still have to stay you know there your eye on the business it's still, still got to be there so i mean it's something that people really need to take into it to there's, there's not a lot of experts that know specifically like they know how to do llc's and how to do that because i've had people get messed up because they went to someone who then didn't understand the real estate rules yep. you know like how you could take your name of your business broker's a little different so uh that is uh, great advice that advice that i just want to reiterate that i think is the key for everyone would be you have to know what your end game is that was perfect because that based on what your bottom line what you want to do that could influence what decision you make you know, uh, and I think your decision was awesome because it's, you just stated, you want the autonomy, you want to be in the control of it, you're responsible for you, you can decide how big you get and you don't have to be at the whim of things changing or brands changing or people buying companies out, right? And that's why it makes sense. Like, that's why I keep on saying you're the perfect example of someone who knows where they've been and know what you want to do and this makes sense for you. Now you can just be comfortable uh, controlling your traditions realty, which is so cool. I love it. So before we go to Ask Five, any other questions, Matt, for, for Paul? No, I'm just looking forward to watching Paul grow over the next year. I know. It's going to be great. Or just do what you want to do and do it in your – and keep making that impact that you make in Houston, right? As so, we were setting up as we were setting up Paul for the show, he was like, yeah, let's let's do it next year when we have uh, – you know, when I have the, the story. No, we'll talk to you in a year or two. Paul. You can see. I'm like, Paul, let's do it now and let's do it next year. You know, have, have <laughs> me back and really talk about where you've been because it is a journey. Well, I'm interested in asking you these Ask Five because I know a lot about what you do in your business, but I just – you know, you just answer the whatever comes to mind. Okay. So Matt, you want to kick that yeah, off? Yeah. yeah. The first question, you know, what really is the best idea you have when you actually, when you coach yourself, obviously, or when Jan coaches you, or, you know, you're talking to other agents or, or when you're starting to build a team, what's going to be your best idea you have for, you know, building that SOI and really building the database? Yeah. I mean, obviously the basics, you know, you got to reach out to your clients and, 
you know, your friends and family and all that fun stuff. But for me, it's, it was making that switch of, of the client parties because no yeah. longer was it like, I'm begging you to do business with me or send me referrals. It's like, Hey, I want to invite you to uh, the client party. And every year I do two parties, um, one in the fall, it's uh, we have barbecue and meet at a brewery and I give out uh, the pie, you know, it's, it seems to be pretty popular. Um, and I, I just been doing that since early on that it's grown from like 30 people to, you know, 200 people. And um, so, yeah, obviously it's a little bit of expensive, but and people look forward to that and you know there's always that that experience where i'm talking with the client they're like wow i didn't realize you knew all these people or helped this many people i'm like yeah it's it's kind of crazy you know so it's kind of helps to, to validate um you know my business and, and professionalism as uh, when people come to see oh, okay great i i am successful and i know what i'm doing and i've helped a lot of clients um so i think that's great because it's again it's just you're asking hey come to the party come come hang out have come have a beer and some barbecue and listen to live music and then i'll give you free pie you know like that's that's a great time so it's an easier conversation to have so i i think that was helpful for me um and then also in the spring i'll do a, a another party it's just a family photo shoot but i mean how few times do people you know update their family photos like it's it's not super right. common, you know, and then you don't go out of the way. So to have that available, Hey, come by, you know, have my lender sponsor some food. Um, and that's a great, great way to call. So I think, um, you know, having that reason to call, let me invite you just, it was easier. And, mm -hmm. um, within that vein, I think, um, I've done pretty much every type of marketing you can think of door knocking, cold calling, all that fun stuff. Um, you know, I really think that if, if you're going to start a new venture, like, I think it'd be great to, to call people on their birthdays. But, you know, if you're going to do something like that, like consider, are you going to do this for the rest of your career? Like, are you going to make time every day, you know, 15 minutes to make the calls to wish people happy birthday, which is a great thing to do, a great way to connect. Right. But if you're not going to do it consistently, which many things I've done over the years did not pan out consistently, then it's just not really necessarily worth your time to even start, you know? So I think that have that mindset, that end, end in mind, of can I, do I see myself doing this for the rest of my, my career? And I bet the answer to doing your two parties is yes, because everybody looks forward to it and it's a way for you to connect with people and have it be fun. And then they remember it. So I, yeah, but I, need, to, I need to digress for just a second. You mentioned the brewery idea. And I noticed, you know, as I was looking out, you know, doing all my little poll research over the last uh, week or so, you know, I did stumble across that, you know, the, uh, the, that you do kind of have a, 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 um, a, a, a hobby and affection towards breweries, I think. So I, I, did, 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 do I see that you wanted to own your own brewery? Is that what the, the <laughs> end game is there? Yeah, I think every, like I'm, I'm a home brewer. I think every home brewer has that dream of starting their oh, own, that's, own brewery. I didn't know you did that. It yeah. made me very happy when I saw awesome. that. Like, Good job. <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I have four taps on. I haven't, it's been so hot and been so busy that I just haven't brewed a lot, but I usually kind of rotate, um, you know, four different things. Uh, I love IPAs and lagers, so usually that, but. All you know, right, we love them more. Yeah, <laughs> We're yeah. People. yeah, so we'll switch out with that, but it's, it's fun. And my dad brewed when we were young. And so I was one of five. And so we would have like a whole brewery where we assemble, like someone would, my dad poured in the beer and then pass the bottle. And then someone put the cap on, pass the, the bottle then someone cap it and someone put it away so we had like a whole you know hall of family brewer assembly line and so it's kind of like something he did growing up and then we kind of do that together now which is kind of fun well jam yes, we my hustle family business yeah <laughs> we'll be making the trip to houston to have an ipa testing or tasting uh you know sometime in the future for Absolutely. sure yeah oh, that'd be great okay well that was a good digression I digress. <laughs> that's like beautiful okay i'm excited about that all right, what's our next question? I'll ask this next one. So we, so obviously, our, in our experience, everyone always tells us, you know, our business, my business comes from refer, mostly from referral and the people that I know. So the next question we want to say, you just answered great uh, for us on like how you stay in touch and what's the best idea you have. What kind of idea do you have to generate new business? What would you share with others on how do you generate new business that's not related to your sphere? So ultimately, you can put them in your database. Sure. You know, I've had some success with uh, local service ads, LSA from from Google. Um, mm. Kind of a pain getting set up through Google to do that. But um, basically, you kind of sit at the top of the search results. Hey, I want a realtor in this area in Houston, you know, and then it'll come up with three agents that are set up through Google. Um, and then just just like anytime a lead comes in, you just try to answer your phone as quick as you can and, and try to service them. 
Um, and the nice thing about that is you don't have to try to rank to be first. You don't have to pay a bunch of money for impressions. It's like you're literally paying for, you know, the lead. And um, it works out about like $70, $75 per lead. Um, and the nice thing is if it's a spam, you can just, you know, protest it. And so if it actually is a client, you're, you know, paying for it. And, you know, if, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have, I don't get a ton. So I don't have a lot that work out, but, you know, when they do $75 for, you know, a, a new client, that's, that's not too bad. So I definitely think that should be part of uh, an arsenal for somebody if they want to add a little extra business and have the time to, to make those calls. Great idea. And do you just set a budget with that? I forgot how it works. Do you set a budget to say, I only want to spend this much and they only charge you when you get a call? Correct. Yeah. And, and I've set my budget as not as high as you can, but I set it up pretty high, like 500 bucks a week. And I think I've only ever done okay, like 150, you know? And so it's like, there's, there's not enough leads to really fill all that. So, uh, or at least in my area. Um, so yeah, I definitely, it's worth, we're trying out. Local service ads, which means you need to get Google reviews. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, which, uh, which we've been working on for a long time. So I'm almost know, good. Almost All at right. fifty. All right. Good. Oh, good. That's beautiful. Yeah. You'll get. All right. Next question, number three. Hey, Paul. Uh, give us a little idea of what what holds you back. Yeah, good question. I was thinking about that, and I think I think success in some some respects. Like, okay, I've achieved good enough. And, um, like is, so can I, you know, is this a point where I need to push and get better and better and better? And in obviously many cases, yes, but I, you know, it's not growth for the sake of growth. So I think there's a little bit of that balance that I kind of go back and forth and reflect on. Um, but sometimes it's like, okay, great. I've, I've had a good enough year. Like it, I've improved great. You know, I had, you know, 10, 20% increase. Awesome. Um, but you know, were those things that I could have done that get even better or have had better conversion or more calls and those kinds of things. So I think, uh, I think that's a challenge that I, um, uh, need to fight through and keep working on. Excellent. Okay. That's a good one. I don't think anybody's yeah. answered that. Love it. So inspiration, what is your latest inspiration? Anything that comes to mind that you want to pass on that's an inspiration to you? It could be people, books, anything. Uh, yeah, I've been pretty big into Seth Godin recently, so I've been kind of consuming all his stuff. Um, you know, I need to get back into some of reading his books, but um, I don't know if you had this, but one of my favorite books of all time is The Talent Code. Um, mm. And I'm trying to remember the name of the author, but basically it's he goes through all these like hotbeds of talent, like um, the the Russian gymnastic team or the North Korean or the South Korean uh, women's um, tennis team or the other the Renaissance painters in, in Italy. And like, he goes through these different things and talks about like, how are these groups created of these crazy hotbeds of talent? And so then he, um, you know, has this, this great uh, diving into, um, you know, kind of the group dynamics, but also like how the brain works and, and elasticity. And like, as you practice certain things, like if you're hitting a baseball, as you get better and work on it, like the, the myelination where your pathways and the neurons start to grow. So it's faster and easier and, and better mm -hmm. for you. So your body in, in the big, the big aha was that our bodies are not just, okay, I'm born this way. This is how I am. And this is the level of success I can get because that's just how I was born to, okay. Oh my goodness. If I practice, if I, you know, improve, if I have um, perfect practices, he talks about, then I can improve this skill and I can have control over my mind and the success in my body um, that I want to with enough practice and dedication. And it was just like a, such a simple like aha, but that was one of the, the, the best ahas I had um, early on in my kind of career uh, trying to figure out life and everything. So I, I, I definitely love that book and, and definitely recommend the it. talent code. Okay. I wrote that down. It's something new today. Again. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. yeah it's a little different. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, the last question, Paul, is really what uh, is your best advice as people are finishing out or as you are finishing out 2023 and, and really, you know, your best advice or how to thrive beyond that? Yeah, good question. I think, like I mentioned earlier, just consistency and um, kind of doing what you do. I think we, we tend to forget, you know, the, the stuff we've had success at. Um, so for me, it's been, been this year's like, okay, I need to do a better job of tracking. You know, I do a pretty good job tracking my clients, where they come from, 
So I know it's a sphere of influence, referral, agent referral, lender referral, that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's been tracking, but then it's also, hey, I need to track my conversion rate for my appointments. Okay, what's my buyer appointment rate success? What's my seller appointment rate success? What can I do to improve that? You know, like the little tiny tweaks and changes. So uh, for me, that's what I'm working on. Um, and uh, hopefully that's helpful for, for others. No, that's great. Can I ask you one last question here about the what any adjustments that you've made in this past year to your business because of the rates, you know, and are you having a similar thing in Houston with low inventory? Um, your inventory is kind of lower state because people don't want to put their homes on the market because they have great rates. Is that what you're running into? Have you what adjustments have you made for your business this year? Or if anything that or that you focus on, because as we go into the new year, I feel like we're going to stay in this market for a little while with all the things that are happening in election year coming, right? Uh, yeah. That's the rates point. are going up. They're not coming down right now as we record this. Right. Yeah, we're still in seller's market. Our inventory's definitely gone up from last year, but prices are still all-time highs as they were last year. So um, we're not in a crazy inventory you know, shortage as we were in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely really helped out in kind of you know that conversation you have to have with sellers like, hey, it's not normal for your home to sell within, you know, two days. That, that's not the normal case. Like it Anymore. was last year. Yeah. So having that conversation and then with buyers, it's like, Hey, the rates are the rates right now. Um, let's make sure that that makes sense for you. And prices are at all time highs still. Like let's make sure that this makes sense for you. I mean, obviously I don't want to like talk someone out of buying, but I do want to you know, have that conversation. Um, and so I've been able to find some more lenders and really kind of steered more toward uh, like uh, credit unions I found they've had uh, better rates. I think I even had one of my clients just got a 5.88% uh, uh, interest rate on 30 year fix. And I was like, holy cats. So I think there's still some, some other ways to kind of go around it, but it's just really been more finding other different credit unions that have worked well. That's really good. And then new builds, do you still have quite a few new builds in the Houston area? Cause that, that's kind of a, an opportunity because a lot of the new builds are competitive you made me think of that when you said credit unions that they're offering incentives to, to come by their higher priced houses, but you get a lower interest rate or maybe we're going to cover your closing costs. Do you still have that in your area? Yeah, they're doing a lot of buy downs. Um, okay. We do have more inventory just because we just have a ton of building going on um, okay. all around Houston. So um, I, I'm starting to see a lot more builders offer different, different incentives, you know, BTSAs and, you know, more buy downs and stuff. So the price is starting to drop. So I definitely think that there is more inventory on the build side. I don't know the stats. I didn't look them up recently, but um, I definitely feel like that right now. Yeah. You got a market that's similar to here. It's not everywhere. Not all parts of the country have a lot of building going on, but I know it's happening in Texas, Florida, and uh, Nevada, and parts of California as well, and, and other states as well. But all right, cool. Any other last questions, Matt? This has been great, great insights. I got to go check out this talent code. It makes me think of that. I know exactly. That's what I was thinking too. Uh, it may, you know what it made me think of, Paul? Um, the, I'm trying to remember the name of it, the Malcolm Gladwell book that, not blank, but the other one that is he, his main premise is. The Outliers? The Outliers, yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Uh, it, about, I mean, it, that talent code went a little deeper, but this was more about if you do something 10,000 hours, if you yeah. do it consistently, you can master it. Yep. And he uses numerous examples like hockey teams and how kids get in earlier in, in Canada and so forth. And they get to practice more uh, from the Beatles as an example of how many hours they practiced before they really hit it big. It's really interesting. So talent code, I'll go look that up. Any yeah. other questions for Mr. Paul Holub? Congratulations on Traditions yeah, Realty. That's yeah, thank you about that for you. Great job, and you're past all the the headaches that come with the administrative, the, the setting up a company and moving over, and now you can just focus on what you want to do, you know, with your clients. So, so good, good luck with that. Have you scheduled your fall event yet? I haven't. Yeah, I need to pick a new brewery. Um, so as we've gotten bigger, a lot of the small breweries won't. Really <laughs> out, so. That's a good problem. Yeah, yeah that is not a bad brewery. problem to have. Yeah, that's true. That's awesome. All right, good. Well, that takes a little effort. You know, when you do these events, you get it down to a system, right? You, you're a good systematic guy. So you have your whole find it, plan it, get the invitations out, get your vendor help and, uh, you know, get the RCPs going. Then you got to go get your pies. Where do you get your pies? <laughs> yeah, there's just a local shop that kind of has its own uh, notoriety here in Houston. Awesome. It's called, Supporting it's the local business. Oh, so, yeah. All right. There you go, folks. Great ideas. Put them to use.
That's right. And thank you for being with us today, Paul. It's really awesome. And it's been fun to watch your prog your progression here as you've, you know, kind of moved into uh, the new brokerage, you know, Traditions Realty. And it'll be really great to get back together. And I'm not, I'm going to hold you to that one. We're going to get back together next year and talk about where you've been and, and uh, you know, the uh, hopefully the the smooth sailing that will occur over the next, uh, yeah. the next 12 months or so. And so we'll also ask you what you're currently brewing. Yeah, yeah, and we'll definitely be asking you that. That is for sure. So if you want to learn more about Paul, more uh, you want to get a hold of Paul, you want more information about Traditions Realty, um, all that information is going to be over at the show notes. Uh, this was episode 253. You can get the show notes over at wbnlpodcast.com. In the meantime, stay safe out there. Prayers to be the people of Maui for crying out loud. That's a frightening uh, situation that's mm -hmm. going on over there in Hawaii. And it, I mean, you see those images and it's, uh, it's really, it's unbelievable to see just the whole streets of cars, just uh, it's yeah. too much. So exactly. prayers and thoughts to go out to everybody over there. And then, you know, everyone here in the, uh, the Southwest of the United States, buckle up babies. I think we might be in for a little bit of uh, some weather. Some, rain, some heavy rains. So weird. Jan and I have done so many podcasts where we have been tracking storms in Florida. Actually, a couple of hurricanes while we were actually, we both were down during Irma down mm -hmm. in Florida. So, um, you know, stay, stay safe out there, everybody. And um, yeah, I got my hurricane preparedness checklist out that I'm modifying for the, the Las Vegas floods. That exactly. Are weird that we you know, that. What's the one thing that usually happens? And you, of course, you had that horrible Houston one that just devastated y'all's area. Uh, what's, what was the name of it? I can't. I'm trying to. Hurricane Harvey. 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 Oh, oh, that was an H hurricane. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, yeah. boy. See, but a lot of times in Florida, I've been there many times for hurricane stuff. They You get so prepared, which is good. So you prepare for the worst and hope for the best, right? And a lot of times they just move, right? And they never come to where you yeah. where you are. That happened kind of to us, but and it may happen this time because, but it doesn't matter where I am in Las Vegas. If it rains like a half an inch, we get some flash flooding. So I'm going to go make sure I have, uh, you know, extra batteries and such and water because people go crazy. They go out and start buying everything, right? Like bread and eggs and milk and water is off the sh and toilet paper. I don't know. Toilet paper. There you go. Filming this on a Friday and I'm thinking, you know, you got to get that IPA stored up too. So there you are. All right. There you go. All right. All right, everyone. Get up, get out, stay safe when you're getting up and getting out there. Um, live the life you've dreamed and be forever wandering, but not lost.